Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be upon all of you. I am Mushafiq and I'll be your MC for the session. Uh, Islamic Knowledge in association with Science and Faith would like to welcome you to today's session on the topic Finding Life Partner by Sheikh Faiz Al Hamadi. Uh, so, without any further ado, let us start with today's session, Sheikh. Thank you very much. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidi Mursaleen wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in amma ba'd. Marriage is something that is natural. But unfortunately I say that it has been distorted by modernism. And it has been distorted by external factors and cultures and mindsets and traditions of things that are un-Islamic. Allah Azza wa Jal yaqul, wa min ayatihi. وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ This is from the signs of Allah. أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْكُمْ أَوْ إِلَيْهَا وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِقَوْمٍ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ It is from the signs of Allah that He created from yourselves partners. We as man and woman, Allah has created us like this to become partners. And to, subhanAllah, look at that word. لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا تَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا means you live in it or you inhabitate in it. Just like a house. And it's a beautiful beautiful world, word if you come and focus on that and just ponder upon this word. SubhanAllah, when you compare, when you say second place you live in or inhabitant, you always come to mind, what comes to mind is a place of security, a place of independence, a place of stability, and a place where you build. It's an infrastructure. And this is what marriage is in Islam. Marriage is something that is so great. And subhanAllah, that's why the shaitan will come and try his best. One of the things, one of his main goals, the shaitan will try to ruin is a relationship between a man and a woman, a husband and a wife. And that's why Allah Azza wa Jal, when He described marriage, He said, وَأَخَذَ مِنْكُمْ مِيثَاقًا غَلِيظًا Meaning a very firm, very strong, very serious covenant, very serious pact between a man and a woman. And in that term or in that statement, Allah Azza wa Jal mentioned it in another, in another situation. When He sent His messengers to us. When he sent his messengers to us, Allah Azza wa mentioned it in Surah Al-Ahzab, verse number 7. He said, وَأَخَذَ مِنْهُمْ As the messengers, وَأَخَذَ مِنْهُمْ مِيثَاقًا غَلِيظًا He took a firm and serious covenant, a pact from these messengers because they have a very serious responsibility. Now, when I talk about marriage being a natural thing but being distorted by modernism, today, subhanAllah, Things has been have been have been reversed. Now the younger generation that are not married that think about being with another that uh, think about having or looking for a partner, they have reversed or they have distorted how to approach this natural, this serious pact and how to apply it in their lives. What do every, a lot of people today? What do they think? They think I have to find a partner to love, and then to marry. Allahu Akbar. This is wrong. What do you mean by love? How can you love someone? How can you love a stranger if you haven't built on that love? There is no such thing as love before marriage. This is called ijab. You're impressed with someone. Don't let, don't let other cultures and movies and social media trick you into this. Allah Akbar. Don't, don't fall into that. Allah Azza wa Jal told us about mawaddatan wa rahmah. 
He have created something between us that is mawadda. Mawadda means like love. And rahma means tolerance and mercy. But when does that happen? When you start building your relationship, not before your relationship. So this is a secondary or something that will be achieved after marriage, not before marriage. And so modernism today, they have reversed it. They told you, no, you have to love first and then get married. I have got, I've, we've gotten married because of love. No, we marry and we love because of marriage. This is what should be, should be the right Islamic approach to this. Because when you think about it, how can someone love another? What does love mean? Love, when you say, I love someone. Loving someone is, is built on conditions, is built on experience, is built on situations. Once you start building a life with one another, respecting one another, agreeing with one another on, on certain aspects and, and, and standards in life, then you start loving one another. When you share something with one another, then you start loving one another. That's why Allah Azza wa Jalla, why did he say, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةً We believers are brothers. What, what, what makes me, me your brother as a Muslim? It's what we share with each other. My belief in Allah, my belief in the angels, my belief in the Prophet, my following the Quran, the Sunnah. This makes me love you. This makes me your brother. This makes us all as one body, as the Prophet ﷺ described. So when it comes from between a man and a woman, how can you love someone that you don't even that you don't even know that you just looked at? And excuse me to say, sometimes you look at someone and you like the way they look. So you're impressed with something that is zahir, that is just apparent, but you don't know what's inside. How can you love? That's foolish. And that's a formula for destruction and a formula for divorce. And that is why if you look at the numbers today, because we've been marrying or the, the, the new generation has been basing their marriage on, on false, false criteria and just impression or in, where they're being impressed with someone so they get married, that have increased or has increased the rate of divorce. And that's why most marriages today are failures. Because of this, because you've started wrong. You put the first foot, that is wrong. So what is marriage? Marriage is a responsibility. And it is a responsibility before it is love and going out and romance and having fun and going to the movies and going for dinner and all that stuff. No, marriage is not like that. Number one, marriage is about also religion. Allah Azza wa Jal put this marriage for you, number one, to survive as a human race. Number two, to fulfill your animalistic instinct, which is, of course, the intimate relationship. Number three, to have responsibility to build a family, to build a society, to build a generation that is coming. And at the end, of course, and part of these things is that it is romance among all the stuff when you build all that stuff the responsibility and the and the proper goal to marriage then comes the love that that would create love for you and that will be a strong true love when you wake up in the morning and you look at your wife or she looks at you and you accept them the way they are with their smelly breath with no makeup with whatever situation they are in you love them it's not about the looks anymore it's about the certain things that you have built together and shared with each other, the good and the bad and the ugly and the tough and the good and all that stuff that creates that strong bond between you. Mithaq and Ghalila. Subhanallah. Now, when you choose your life partner, when you choose your life partner, what should you do and how should you choose? Choose her or you choose him. Know for a fact that Whatever, like I mentioned, today what modernism encourages people to look into as criteria of marriage is false. As a matter of fact, like I said, it's a formula for destruction and a formula for divorce. Don't look at a woman and don't look at a guy that is social media material. TikTok material or a girlfriend or all that stuff or they have the money or they have... No, you look at a person's piousness. I'm giving you something that will last and that will be beneficial for you in this life and in the hereafter. When you choose a partner, 
you have to look at their closeness and their application in Islam. And before that, you have to be a good Muslim. Because when you have the standards of Islam, and she or he has the standards of Islam, that will minimize your disagreements. What do I mean by that? Meaning, see, in any company, any partnership, any government, if you don't have policies and procedures and rules and laws and regulations that you agree on and you glorify ta'zim and you follow, then it will be chaotic and there will be a lot of disagreements and there will be a lot of fights. So what I'm saying is that you, between you and that partner, you should both at the beginning, at the infrastructure, at the fundamental part of marriage, you'll have to tell her or tell him that between me and you and what rules us and our relationship together is kitabullah wa sunnata rasulillah. Religion, Islam is what rules us. What is right is what Allah says what's right. What is wrong is what Allah says what's wrong. Not me and you. This is very important. What am I saying? I'm saying that you have to have both agreed rules and regulations and laws and, 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 and policies that will rule both of you. Once you have that, then the disagreements will minimize so much that you will live a good life. So the, the first thing that you need to do when choosing a life partner, that you have to look for a person that shares with you the same standards as you share, which is, of course, religion. What is haram is haram. What is halal is halal. That's what we follow. And when you come to practicality and application of this, I'm talking about a woman that is following the obligations in Islam. She is praying. She wears her hijab. And you are, you are, you are a man who prays. You are a man who applies the rules of Allah. Now, once you do that, and once you meet someone who's like that, then that's good. Because nowadays I see people, what happens? They meet someone. They meet a woman. Allah, she's not, for example, she's not wearing the hijab. No problem. Allah will guide her. May, may Allah will guide her, but she's good. She looks good. She looks good. She comes from a good family. So I want to marry her. Habibi, but what about the standards? Maybe she has different standards than you. La, la, I'll tell her about the hijab and all that stuff later. La, this is wrong. This is wrong. You have to start with the policies and procedures. You have to start and agree, both of you, that what is halal and what is haram, and then apply it, and then go for marriage. And this is what a lot of people fall into. They sacrifice. They say, no problem. Later, later. First, I want to get married. Or because he has a relationship with someone, and I say this, this is a haram thing, of course, that having a relationship, a boyfriend or a girlfriend, this is something that is not allowed. This is not an, a, a proper approach to, to, to a good marriage. So this is what happens, is that they come and they want to marry. They start letting go of these very critical things and these criteria that they follow. For example, a guy says, I don't want only a hijab girl. Or a woman that says, I don't want a person who doesn't pray. And then they meet someone, they're like, he doesn't pray. No problem. We'll accept him and later we'll strive to fix it. No, don't say that. Choose someone as per your criteria. Because this is a life commitment. If you don't do that, later on he will tell you or she will tell you, excuse me, we didn't agree on this. So what are you saying? I'm not going to wear the hijab. Or he will say, well, I don't pray. I don't, I don't do that. Or he will neglect his prayers. Or whatever reason he will, he will give you. Or things that you are looking for. Tayyip. And like I said, having a boyfriend or a girlfriend, this is a call for destruction. A man came, a, a young man came to the Prophet والسلام, Permit zina for me. What does he mean? He means he wants to have a girlfriend. Ya Rasulullah, I want to have a girlfriend. Please allow this for me. What did he say, the Prophet ﷺ? He says, would you allow this? Would you accept this for your mother or your sister or your auntie? He said, la ya Rasulullah. He said, then the people don't accept that. And we as Muslims, we don't accept that. Why? Because it's disrespectful. Because you approach a woman or a man 
with a violation of Allah, with a disobedience of Allah. And what do you want when you have a boyfriend or a girlfriend? What kind of relationship is this? Is this built on halal or haram? It's built on haram. And when you build something on haram, no doubt, in the future, later, it will bite you. It will come and affect you in a, in a negative way. It will ruin your life. And so starting a relationship with someone as a boyfriend or girlfriend is false. Stay away from this stuff. Tayyib Faris, how do we meet the good wife? Or how do we meet the good husband? Ya Habibi, there is connections. There is con Subhanallah, all of Islam, when you look at it, we're all connected with one another. When it comes to society, maybe you have some relatives, maybe you have some friends who has a brother, who has a sister. And so you ask around. And why is this a very, very effective way? Because then you have a reference. You can ask about this person. Is that a good person or not? I know his family. I know where he lives. I know where he works. I know all the stuff. So you can ask about him. And that's very, very important. So the proper way is by connections. By connections. Or also, you're working somewhere. Yeah, you're working somewhere. You find someone. You find someone that... Yeah, and I say, initially, suit looks good. Mashallah, hijab. Mashallah, she's, she looks good. Looking good and looking pretty or you're impressed with someone's look is not haram. Relax. Find someone that you that you find uh, find good, good looking. It's, it's not haram. It's, it's good. It's recommended. But of course, religion comes first. Priority is a religion. And how how good she is as a person or how good he is as a person. This is very important. So once you find that, then you start going through the, the Islamic permissible steps. What is that? If you find someone at work, you take her father's number, you take uh, her mother's number, and you contact her. And of course, as you guys know, initially I say, guys propose to girls. But I don't cancel out that a, a girl can propose to a guy also. That happened at the time of the Prophet, والسلام, there's no shame in that. But unfortunately, I say be today, because of tradition and because of culture, this is something that's looked, uh, looked down on. I say, keep it as an option for the girls. Keep it as an option and something that's not haram. It's not something that's terrible to do. No. So you find someone in school, at work, I mean school, university, at work, things like that. That can be a sign that this is a good person and this is a person that I want to spend the rest of my life with. Or like I said, by, uh, by uh, relatives or connections. And ya ikhwan, ya akhawat, brothers and sisters, do not forget. The main thing that you need to do if you want to find a good partner is that you have to go refute and seek refuge to Allah. Seek refuge to Allah. Ista'in billah. Go to Allah and ask him with your dua. Always do dua that Allah provides you with a good husband or a good wife. Yaqi, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam described it as completing half your religion. Half your religion, 50% of it is completed if you marry someone that is good. And the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam described it as happiness. He said, one of the things that, are, that is happiness in this life is finding a good partner. Al-mar'atu salihah. A good, pious partner. Of course, he said, Mar a good wife, but also a good husband. Also a good husband. So you have to be very careful who you choose. And like I said, don't let your emotions choose for you. Let piousness and the, what, what applies in Islam choose for you. Let your brain and your logic and your strategic look into the future, your future choose for you. Don't say, oh my God, I like the way she, she laughs and I like the way she looks. So this is a good good wife and a good mother for my future children, inshallah. No, 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 no. This is, this is something that is, that is foolish because it's very short-sighted, subhanAllah. And today we live in a world of materialism. Today we live in a world of show. Everything is show. Everything is processed. Everything is commercialized. That's why we have, subhanAllah, social media uh, platforms that put filters upon filters upon filters. Why? Because everybody wants the vahir. Everyone wants 
what what is on the outside nobody cares about what's inside what's from the inside and it's a problem you'll have to reassess these things when you choose a life partner when you want to build mithaq and ghalida like i mentioned طيب. when it comes to marriage and when you are married inshallah what is the responsibility of a man and a woman what is the responsibility of a husband and wife do not think that this is a democracy guys do not think marriage is a democracy no marriage is not a democracy marriage is guardianship and islam came to divide what is for a woman and what is on a woman and what is for a husband or a wife and what is for a husband and what is for, uh, to the husband what's his right and what the rights that he should give for the wife and that's why subhanallah allah has in the quran subhanallah and you notice yaqi if you look at the quran he talks a lot allah has talks a lot about husband and wife talks there's a whole surah about nisa there's a whole surah about talaq because this is something serious and allah has knows us knows that we're gonna we're gonna mess this up and that's why he gives us very clear instructions on when a husband and a wife or a man and a woman get together what are the responsibilities with them and that's why a surah is a very important surah that people a lot of people misunderstand when allah has this in this surah, a lot of people think that Allah is favoring men against women, and that's not true. means guardianship, means Allah is telling men that you are responsible, that you have to provide shelter. That you have to financially support your women, that you have to give advice to your woman and see and make sure that this woman that you have taken as a wife, that she has a good life, good well being, not to make her sad, not to oppress her, not to transgress against her. Zulm, transgression is a great thing that Allah will punish you for. And that's why Allah has or the Prophet. When he talked about responsibilities, he says, Kullukum ra'in wa kullukum mas'ulun an ra'iyati. All of you are responsible and all of you are accountable for who is under you, for who you are, for you, who you are responsible on. So when a man, these are the things that a man is responsible on. First of all, he has to provide, it's an obligation to provide shelter for his wife. And you have, it's an obligation that he spends on his wife. He has to spend on his wife. And he has to give her nasiha and see her well-being in her, in her life. This is all on the man. And in return, because the man is providing all this, the woman, the wife, should obey her husband. Obey her husband in things that are permissible. Obey her husband in things that are obligatory, not on things that are haram. And Allahu Akbar, today I see people, I see husbands ordering their, 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 their wives into haram things. Wallahi, I... I yeah, personally, I've come across people, men, who say who say to their to their wives, remove the hijab. I don't like you wearing the hijab. I want you to go out with me without the hijab. How is this possible? If you notice somebody who's like that, that's a red flag. That's a red flag. This is not somebody who is pious. This is not somebody that he fears Allah. This is not somebody that even knows what is Islam and what is his obligation towards towards his wife. So, like I said, الرجال قوامون على النساء. Like I, I mentioned, she has to obey him, but in return, he provides her shelter, he provides her financial service, uh, service. he provides her financial support, and he spends on her, and he gives her the nasiha, the good nasiha, and he sees for her well-being and her, and her daughter or her, her children's well-being. Now, this is the responsibility of a man and a woman. Can we say... We have to be perfect. Don't expect, don't expect people to, to be perfect. That's why Allah Azza wa Jal said in the Quran, fil Quran, وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمًا وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمًا There is tolerance between you and there is rahma, mercy, because you are going to make a mistake and she is going to make a mistake. A husband and wife will make mistakes. Will, there will be some, some downfalls. 
And that's why the Prophet ﷺ came to tell you what to do. He said, لا يفركو, لا يفركو. مؤمن مؤمنة. إن كره منها خلق رضي منها آخر. Don't hate. Don't hate your wife. Because if you dislike something about her or she did something that is bad, don't cancel her. She's the worst husband. She's the worst wife. She's the, she doesn't do anything. No. Remember the good things that, that she does. إن كره منها خلق رضي منها آخر. If you dislike something about her, Something about her personality, something about her habits, something about the way she looks, something about the way she says. Yeah, you like things. Don't don't forget about the things that you like about her. Maybe she's a pious woman. Maybe she's a good cook. Maybe she 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 cracks nice jokes with you. And whatever it is, so don't forget this. Don't be don't have ghulm when it comes to your wife because of one little thing you exaggerate. So oh, she's the worst person, and also the woman. If a man does one bad thing, don't cancel him out. See what's, what, are, what are the good things about him. And the Prophet ﷺ said something about a woman and a man. We are different. We are different. Just like, as, just like Allah gave us different responsibilities, because we are different, we have to identify that. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ, what did he say? He said, treat women, women or wives nicely. They are created from a curved rib. A curved rib. What does that mean, curved rib? Is that a bad description? No, you misunderstood if you think that. The Prophet does not transgress against women. But the Prophet is trying to teach you something. He's saying that they are different. If you are, this is you as a rib, she is like this, a curved. That's not bad. That's not a bad thing. And then he said, if you try to straighten it, you'll break it. Meaning that if you're trying to treat her like a man, if you tra treat your woman, your wife as a man, you'll break her. Because she's not like that. Women are emotional. Women are, are sensitive, more sensitive than you are. So you'll have to be careful of these things. And you have to treat her like a, like a woman. And wallahi, guys, guys, some guys, may Allah guide them, they are like a military general when it comes to, to their wives. Like this. She's like a soldier. Ah, this is not how you treat women. You treat women with love and affection. Look at the Prophet, والسلام, how he treated his women, how he treated his wives. He treated them with love and compassion and emotion. And you have to say this. Women like to hear, my love, darling, beautiful, they, ha they want to hear these things and it really affects them. Women don't understand that. So what is this love, one, love, dove stuff? We don't understand. We understand what's in our stones. We are, we are very uh, materialistic beings. Feed me. Uh, stay, away from my, uh, stay away from me. Don't, don't bother me when I'm doing work. I love you. This is the best thing. You, you're treating me wonderful. Women are different. Women know. You have to be emotional with them. You have to come close to them. You have to show them that you care, good listener. You have to treat them, uh, talk to them nicely. So we're different. And you have to understand that. Treat her with love and affection and mercy and mercy. The Prophet ﷺ I will hold you accountable for the rights of two, two weak things or weak people in this life. He said, The orphan and the woman. The woman, no doubt, she is weak with her physical being. You are stronger than her in your physical being. But she is mental. She needs mental. She needs affection. She needs all the stuff. And don't deprive her of that. And don't deprive her of, of, of whatever she needs, whether it's something that is physical, physical intimacy, or even emotional intimacy. And this is great. This is something very critical in a woman. According to the man, no. Feed his stomach. And be a good wife, as in don't be negative and don't complain too much. And wallahi, your husband, this is the secret recipe to a, a, a very pleased husband. This is what I have to say. I'm sorry if I took long, but I want to keep some, uh, because I think this, this subject, 
needs more interaction than just talking. So I want to hear from you guys if you guys have any question about about this very big issue and how we can tackle it and how you can benefit from uh, from from this. Uh, yes, we got the questions, yeah. and I would like to present them to now to you. We have uh, one question: uh, How to know that you are marrying the right person? How to know that you're marrying the right person? This is, of course, something that's very critical and fundamental. I I always tell say this to people: Don't ask about the hukum. Don't ask about the ruling after you have done the action because then it's not very beneficial i see a lot of people what do they do they do something and then they say what is the ruling on this haram or haram okay, well, you've done it already what do you what is that you have to ask before and in this question in this uh, scenario i i want to apply the same concept don't ask about the right person after you got married to him or her because then it's just complicated and it's going to be a mess you have to ask about the right person before marrying him now, generally speaking, like I said, the first thing that you need to know is that how close he is to Allah. The closer he is to Allah and the more fearing he is to Allah, the better the person he is. That's number one. Number two, his manners. Because subhanAllah, don't يعني, I have to be truthful about this and we all seen this. There are some people who are close to Allah but they are so, so bad and so tough on people. And this is known. Close to Allah, but he doesn't care about people. And he's very, very يعني, unfair to people. And that is something that you need to also look into. Someone is tolerant. Someone is merciful. When he talks, he talks with nice, gentle words. He's not angry. Temper, if he, somebody gets angry a lot, and he doesn't let go, he's very, how to say it, he's very uptight on things, then this is not a good person for marriage. And there is something that's very, very important. I should have actually mentioned this before, but subhanAllah, this about marriage, this subject is never ending. Allah, Wallahi, it's a big subject. Taghaful. Taghaful is one of the secrets of a happy marriage. And this is how you know you've married somebody who's good. And if he's not good, inshallah, you can develop him to be a good person, you or him. Taghafur means letting go or you choosing to ignore some things. And this is something very important. Some people, subhanAllah, on the little small things, they make it a big thing, exaggerate. And they want to argue about the smallest things and the silliest things. And this mentally, mentally, it will affect you. And Allah, it has, it has very bad results psychologically and in the relationship with your with your husband and wife, or husband or wife. So taghafur is something that's very, very important. Unless, of course, it is something that is violates the Islamic laws. Just like the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, Aisha, used to say the Prophet, alayhi salatu, never got angry with anything that's worldly. Never told me, why did you do this? Or why did you do that? Or why is the food like this? Or why is the food like this? He never said anything like that. Unless it is violating the rules of Allah. Then he gets angry. And this is how we should be. At least get close to the, to this kind of concept. So I think this is the, the main thing about how do you know if you're marrying the right person is that he is close to Allah and he is merciful and tolerable with people. Look, him, look at him. How is his relationship with his mother, with his brothers and sisters, with his colleagues, with his brothers yani around him, his friends? How is he? And who are his friends? These are things that will let you know, give you the indication that this guy is a good person. And before that, just something, that, sorry I took long, but before that, ask Allah to bless you with a good person, with a good husband or wife. Sincerely, seriously ask him and be consistent with that dua, always. And even if when you get married, ask Allah to preserve that person, that husband of yours or that, that wife of yours, to make them a good person. If they're not a good person, make them a good person. Because Allah is the one that guides. And maybe he's a bad person. Allah will guide them to be a good person. You don't know. Or maybe he's a good person. Allah will test him and he will become a bad person. So always ask Allah for these things. Wallahu
جزاك الله خير واياكم Uh, we have the next question. If we want to marry someone, and we have two choice, parents' choice and my own choice, both of them have nice religion. What should I do? Following my parents or my choice? This is a very good question, <laughs> and this is something very, very important. When she, sh- uh, may Allah bless her, she said, "Parents, parents' consultation and parents' advice is extremely critical." for the husband and for the wife why do i say that because sometimes in many cases when we marry we marry according to emotions or we look at someone from one angle the 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 family the mom and the dad and the sisters and the brothers if they are into this يعني, into this decision they will look at it from other angles too and you combine all of them together now one thing for sure If you and her, uh, you or the parents, they both have conflicting, conflicting advice or conflicting choices. If he says, marry this person, and you say, no, I marry that person, see what you both agree on. So, for example, if, if, if the parents say, no, that person that you chose, he is bad. You'll have to dig in. You'll have to see why do they say he's bad. Sometimes they're right. Sometimes they're wrong. Sometimes you're right. Sometimes you're wrong. And, and this is something very important. A lot of people come and ask me, my parents don't want me to marry this person. I am so distressed. I'm so sad. I don't know what to do. I say, brother or sister, maybe they're right. Maybe they're, not a good, they're, maybe they're not a good candidate. So you'll have to look into what are the reasons. And reason and discuss it with your family. And also, lastly, don't forget to do istikhara. Do istikhara. Istikhara is one of the most important things that you do in life or in, when, you, when you marry. And of course, istikhara does not mean that you're confused when you're confused between two things. No. When you decide, I decided to marry this person, now do istikhara. And when you do istikhara, that doesn't mean that you'll have to see a vision or a dream or things like that. That's not it. It's just things will just be simplified for you. umur. Things will roll out in front of you like it's, that's, it's, just, it's meant to be. Subhanallah. The next question is uh, an anonymous question, but uh, so this question is about, I want to learn about halal dating or the correct way of dating. How do we know, how do we go about dating the right way, especially in the Western world, which is like with temptations, limitations and misunderstandings? See, you're living in the West, you're living in Asia, living in the Middle East, There, Islam is one. Islam is one. There is no such thing as halal dating. There is no such thing as halal dating. If you think that you are going to date a person, a, ma- a, 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 a partner, you will date them before marriage and going out with them to dinner or whatever you want to go to the park or just hang out with them, socialize with them, that is haram. The Prophet ﷺ said, إياكم, إياكم, Beware of entering or mixing with women. إياكم الدخول على النساء. And the Prophet ﷺ said, The greatest fitna that will be on you is the fitna of the nisa, of women, as a man. And of course, vice versa. Even the women. You cannot go and enter and mix with, with men. This is not the right way. It's haram. And you're building something on haram. What you need to do, like I said, if you know someone at work, you know someone from a relative, Maybe your neighbor, she's a good candidate. You go to her father, you go to her family, and you engage. Have an engagement. Go see her nadra shar'iya, the Islamic way onto coming, coming and sitting with the person and, 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 and meeting them, and then seeing if she, they're a good candidate. How do you meet them? The nadra shar'iya, I don't know if you guys, you understand the concept of nadra shar'iya, right? MC, I think, should I elaborate on that or you guys know this? I think you can elaborate a little bit. Okay. Another Sharia is that when a man goes and sees a woman that he feels that she's a candidate for, for marriage. He sees her and he looks at her, her face, and he even can talk to her and discuss matters with her, but in front of her family. Tayyip Faris, I went and I sat down with her and she was shy. I spoke a little bit. 
It was five minutes meeting and I left. I'm not satisfied. I went to see her again. No problem. Go see her again with her family, with her mahram. Mahram is who? Her father, her brother. Go see her one more time. Adi. Relax. As a matter of fact, I think in this time and age, things are getting confusing. I think you should. this should be increased more. This should be a cultural thing now. Khalas, yeah, go meet her one time, two times, three times, four times, and sit with her. Wallahi, this is something that I have done. My wife, Nadra Shari, it took me, I think, one hour and a half talking and discussing and talking and discussing. And then I met her again with her, uh, other members of the family, and I spoke and I discussed with her family and I spoke with her. And I even, I even sat down with her a third time. And that's not haram. This is what we call Nadra Shari. So you are comfortable and you see something or you know something about her that will make you decide. She's the good candidate. And also you, it's like an interview. Sit down and talk to them. This is what I call the halal way. But you and her going behind your parents' back, and even if your parents know, it's haram. This is not, this is not the right way. And as the Prophet ﷺ said, if a man and a woman meet together alone, then the third person with them who? Shaitan. Shaitan is with you. He's definitely going to want you to do haram. And you will do it eventually. So, so halal dating is not the way. Westernized wor world or Asia or anything, go and meet her parents and go sit with her with the presence of her mahram. That's fine. Totally fine. Wallahu Thank you. Um, Most welcome. So the following will be the last question. You have mentioned that uh, about istikhar. So uh, what is the correct way of to do istikhar and how do we know what is the this, the decision from istikhar? Wait. Al-istikhara means counseling. Tastakhir. Who? Allah Azza wa Jal. And subhan, this is from Tawheed. Because you refute to, the, to, to, the, to your creator, the all-knowing. If you look at the dua of, of istikhara and just contemplate on the words, you will know that this, you're, you're asking Allah for one thing. Asking some Allah if this one thing is correct or not correct. How do you do it? You pray two rak'as. And it can be any time. Even in, in, in times that is makruh to pray, it's fine to pray salat al-istikhara. Like, for example, before Maghrib, this, uh, the ulama said in this uh, period, it's makruh or not allowed to pray prayers, sunnah prayers. But salat al-istikhara, because it is something that is, it has a mean, you, ha you have a purpose for it. You want to ask Allah something. That's number one. So uh, first you pray two rak'ahs. Two rak'ahs you pray. Then after you do this, you finish the two rak'ahs, you do salam. Salam alaikum, salam alaikum. Then you raise your hand and you do the dua. You say the dua. The dua should be in Arabic because it is an act of worship. An act of worship should come as they are. Just like when you're reciting the Quran or when you're reciting the Quran in the salah. Should it be in English? Can it be in English? The answer is no. It should be in Arabic. Just like any adhkar you say it in, in salah. Should, can it be in English? The answer is no. It should be in Arabic. So, Salat al istikhar or Dua al istikhar should be in Arabic. Like, Faris, I'm Malaysian or I'm Indian or I don't know Arabic. No problem. There is, alhamdulillah, on the internet, on Google, you can say istikhara uh, Dua and you'll find it written in English but in Arabic pronunciation. So, take that and I'm, inshallah, there is no dis, يعني, there is no dispute or you'll find another Dua al istikhara It's one. Everybody knows it. So take that dua, no problem to put it in a piece of paper and read it while you're raising your hand, read it in a piece of paper and do the dua. That's it. Then what happens? When do you do it? When you have decided, like I said, you decided, I have, I feel okay with this person. I am choosing this person. Then you do the salat al-istikhara. And in that salat al-istikhara, you ask Allah if that person is good or not. This is salat al-istikhara. Can I do it more than once? Yes, you can do it more than once because it's a dua. And dua, you can do it more than once, whatever you want. Add. Tayyip Faris, after I have done it, what should we, what, how is the sign? The sign is like I said, it's not necessarily a vision. It's not necessarily a dream. It's not necessarily a feeling. It's not necessarily a sign that you see in front of you. And be careful, this can be something that's even shirk sometimes. What do I mean by that? Wallah, I, I did Salat al-Istikhara. And I, I, about this person, about this uh, man. And subhanAllah, when I did Salat al-Istikhara, I went from, the, I, I came out of the house or I left the house, my home, and I saw a black cat. 
Oh, that's a bad sign. A'udhu Billah. This is Tiyara. This is called bad omen. What Tiyara to shirk. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, bad omen, if you believe in them, it is shirk. So be careful of that. These, these silly signs and, and superstitions that we see, that's not part of Istikhara's, uh, istikhara's answer or result. Simply, what happens in Istikhara that things get simplified for you. Things roll out and become so easy for you. I'll give you an example. This happened to me uh, personally. I, I made, I, I'm covering this by the way. I have a surgery on my neck. At the time of the surgery, uh, I met a, a surgeon. I did istikhara. I did istikhara on that surgeon to do, to do the, the surgery for me. The surgery was from the front. He opens my neck from the front. And it was a very complicated surgery. I did istikhara on that. Subhanallah, it didn't work out. The insurance company called me. They said, no, you need to see another doctor and you'll have to see this doctor. W without, without it, we're not going to give you permission, uh, approval on the surgery. I went to see that doctor. He presented to me a different method, a new method of that surgery. I said, subhanAllah, that's good. So I looked into this method and so I found another surgeon that does it. And it was very good method. Alhamdulillah. I did istikhara on that method. And wallahi, I tell you, the surgeon told me, your surgery is next week. I did istikhara. After I did istikhara, I went to do an exam. I finished on the same day. I did the exam. He called me. He said, tomorrow is your surgery. Khalas, it not next week. Tomorrow is your surgery. Things worked out. Alhamdulillah. I said, okay, khalas. This is, this is good. See what I mean? This is what istikhara's result is. Just things roll out and be simplified for you. Allahu alam. If you have another question or you have time, it's fine, by the way, because I know this subject is more about interaction more than just talking about things. At the moment, we don't have any other questions. So, uh, one, one follow up question on the istikhara. Sometimes we have misconception that istikhara needs to be done when we have like two choices. So, some people think that when we have two choices, then only we should do istikhara. Is it something yeah. that we have to do two choices or we decide on our own that of the two choices, one is the best one. We do counseling, we talk to someone and then we do istikhara on that one situation, one person. What you what you just explained, that's the correct way, mashallah. So when you decide, decide first and then do, do if you're confused, don't do istikhara yet. It's not, you, you, this is not the step where you do istikhara. Decide for yourself. Look at the pros and cons and everything like that. Then do istikhara. And one last thing, guys, one last thing. This is something that's very practical. And this is from my own experience. I tell you this. Please, this is important. Guys, when you get married, because of because of the big distortion about marriage and how people are not getting it right today and the high rate of, of divorce, don't get children in the first year. At least, at least first year. And I tell you this from my own experience and what I've seen and, and know people in court and everything. Because at the first year, get to know each other. Get to know each other. First year, second year, you're stable, you're comfortable, then get children. Because wallahi, the worst thing that you can do is you get children, then you get a divorce. You have transgressed against these children. This is not their fault because you haven't made bad choices in life and you leave them. Uh, without without two parents. And this is very bad. So this is just my final advice. Barakallahu uh, alaikum. Yeah. With this, we have come to the end of our session. We hope that today's session was beneficial for everyone. We thank Sheikh Fariz. May Allah bless him and all those who are watching this. May Allah bless you and your families. Uh, you'd like to say anything before we end the session, Sheikh? I ask Allah Azza wa Jal to guide us all to a good marriage and good partners in life. And wallahi, in this small step, you are helping and, and, and increasing this ummah and making it making it an honorable ummah. So make a right choice and Allah, may Allah bless you with choosing a right the right partner and may Allah bless you in your marriage. Ameen, ameen. We end with the dua, subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik, ashadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfirka wa tubu ilayk. Amen. Sakallah khair.